Today we are very happy uh, to have Paul Light join us uh, for our Governance Salon, uh, that, which is a special event that we put on uh, no more than twice a year, uh, welcoming scholars to have an intellectual exchange with our community here. Um, Paul is the Paulette Goddard uh, Professor of Public Service at New York University's Wagner School of Public Service. Uh, he came to NYU after serving as Vice President and Director of Governmental Studies at the Brookings Institution, designing new initiatives for civic engagement as the Director of the Public Policy Program at Pew Charitable Trusts, educating future public servants as Professor and Associate Dean of University of Minnesota's Hubert Humphrey Institute, strengthening public management as a senior advisor to U.S. Senator John Glenn and the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee and overseeing the research agenda at the National Academy of Public Administration. Paul has a uh, very, um, uh, let's say, uh, prolific uh, academic record, but also a very strong record within public service, as, as you might note from these different titles. Um, I was first introduced to Paul's work uh, early in my graduate studies, and it was from uh, Paul's own work uh, from his early career on the appointee careerist nexus in the federal service that in part uh, inspired my work in that area. And as government has changed significantly uh, in that time, Paul has been an intellectual leader in documenting and assessing the changes that have happened to government. Contractors, or what's also been called the parallel state, as at least as some describe it, uh, now outnumber civil servants uh, within the federal government by at least a four to one clip. We know this primarily because of Paul's own work. And today, Paul talks to us about his newest book on exactly that topic called The Government Industrial Complex that examines uh, the blended workforce, its shape, its size, and implications to the next generation of public servants and governance writ large. And so it's really my honor and pleasure to, uh, to have invited Paul and to have him accept our invitation as our speaker today. So thank you very much, Paul, and we're looking forward to a wonderful talk. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, yes. It, it is a time of year which should be near perfect uh, weather-wise. So it's, I come out here every March. I, I do like coming out here. I hang out a little bit with Rand and I do so much admire this uh, program. Uh, it's got good heft and a strong backbone of research uh, at a great university and it's nice to be here. Moreover, there's now light rail uh, from uh, Santa Monica here it's no problem getting here. Uh, 10 years ago, no way. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about my ongoing work. How many of you are doctoral students here? Yeah. So one of the reasons that um, I continue to push out uh, uh, work is that I set some good trend lines earlier in my career. And what you end up then doing from a professional standpoint is you're updating and filling in new data uh, to extend trend lines to test what you've done. And in this particular case, uh, we have additional trend line data now to see what has happened to the true size of the federal government. Um, this title here, uh, uh, 1984 to 19, uh, 2018, I wrote a book in the mid 90s on the true size of government, 1984, uh, to 1990s, uh, to 1994, I believe. Uh, we'll see the trend line here. And then you keep updating to see what's going on so that you're probing these trend lines. And I've had the good fortune of selecting some trend lines uh, that have shown some strength over time for illuminating questions that uh, your faculty members here are, are grinding down in, uh, into with great um, strength and rigor and so it's this kind of symbiotic relationship where you know we're continuing to push out trend lines and finding out how we can go deeper and more effectively into some of these patterns and you know bless you if you can find a trend line that you're going to nurture over time uh, I was at a meeting a couple of months ago at Berkeley uh, we were looking at uh, sort of the tidal creep uh, 
at the top of the federal government. This is data that I collected uh, years ago looking at federal yellow book phone books. Uh, uh, Monitor Publishing is a big operation. Their sole product are federal phone books, lobby, lo phone books of lobbyists, reporters, state and local government officials, and so forth. And these phone books have titles in them. And if you keep track of these titles and kind of push them along, we'll see a little bit of this later, uh, you can see how the federal government hierarchy is thickening. And we're going to turn Professor Resch here on, on it uh, to really find out what's going on down below in the hierarchy and what this data actually uh, uh, means. So we'll go into it in just a little bit. Um, this is the book. Uh, the, the Oxford University Press asked me, you know, what would I like to see? And I said, well, how about an iceberg? Um, yeah, we got an iceberg. I don't like this cover at all because uh, there is no bottom of the iceberg. I suppose that's the conceit that we're going to find out what's down there. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit uh, about this work, uh, engage in a little conversation. Uh, the answer is that we have a blended workforce. It's been relatively stable. We use contactor, contractors and grantees for surge, uh, as a surge workforce that we can call on during wartime and economic crisis. The federal workforce has been remarkably steady. So we get a presidential candidate like Donald Trump who says, this is outrageous. The federal government has never been bigger. We've got to downsize. We're going to have a hiring freeze. But when you look at the data over a long period of time, what you see is remarkable stability in the headcount of federal workers and then expansion and contraction in the workforce of contractors and grantees. And one of the questions uh, we have to ask is like, how do we manage this multi-sector workforce? Are there useful ways of categorizing uh, workers and motivations? Should we be purchasing, as we were just talking about, should we be purchasing a certain type of motivation? Are we purchasing skills? Are we purchasing specific services like lawn mowing or uh, cemetery services at what cost and so forth? We have a blended workforce. It's not going away. The question is how we use it. And we've had this blended workforce uh, from uh, the very founding of our government, our constitution. We've been using contractors for a long time, and we've been using nonprofit employees for a very long time. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. It's a delight to talk to you about it here. Um, I put together this presentation. This is a blend of ongoing work that I've been doing. Um, baby boomers fit in here because there's a chapter in here about the so-called next gen public service. We're looking at the movement of the baby boomers into a blissful retirement. You know, I don't even ride in elevators with Gen Z's and millennials. I, I'm scared of them because they want us to get out. Right. So it's like and you're I can see you're like, yes, um, you know, what's happening now in the federal government is a sort of great generational turnover. I'm not sure how big it's going to be. You, you're patterning that. I'm sure watching it. Uh, you're, you've got colleagues here at, at at the school who are watching this. But we saw a slight uptick in retirements two quarters ago, uh, at the end of 2018, the last two quarters of FY18, we saw federal retirements starting to rise. There's been some other research on retirements in the senior executive service that suggests there's something happening. Almost 30 years ago today, uh, Paul Volcker, who was the uh, former Federal Reserve Board Chair, uh, met with uh, President George H.W. Bush to present the final report of his 1988 National Commission on the Public Service. And the commission report talked about the quiet crisis in the federal service. Now, those of you who want to like a, a little writing technique, when you don't really have a crisis, you can define it as the quiet crisis. So it's like something that's coming we're not really sure when it's going to be here. It's kind of like the song in, in West Side uh, Story. Something's coming, not sure when, but it's coming. 
And we were warning in that report, and I uh, got involved in that at the very end of the commission because a dear colleague of mine uh, passed away suddenly. Uh, the quiet crisis was that there was going to be this turnover effect coming uh, as the baby boomers would exit. We could see it even then. There had been a big hiring surge in the 1970s. We had the Great Society hiring sur surge. And federal employees were in the midst of about a 40 to 45 year career, and we saw it coming. And we're now seeing that quiet crisis really come to the fore. Uh, we expect that the shutdown will trigger a lot of uh, conversation and possible decisions in the near term uh, to leave the federal government. And the question is, what are we going to do with that? It's a wonderful opportunity. It's something that we're paying a lot of attention to. And one of the answers is that uh, the baby boomers are leaving. It's going to be the millennials, some Xers, but the millennials and uh, the Gen Zs. And we don't really know what to do with Gen Z just yet. We're really not sure. We're welcoming and, and loving towards Gen Z. We don't have a clue. Uh, so we've got that coming down the pike. Anyway, uh, the government industrial uh, complex, this, this uh, piece of research that I've written, is, is basically asking how big is the federal government? Anyway, I mean, how big is it? You know, presidential candidates say they're going to downsize. So the traditional focus of how big is the federal government is on spending and headcount. So if you go to the historical tables of the U.S. budget, uh, the, the current budget, for example, has, has a big, uh, uh, a couple of big tables that show the total headcount in FTE. So we know how many people work for the Department of Defense, for HHS and so forth, and we know what percent of the workforce uh, these people occupy. We just don't know much about the true size of the proxy workforce. What were you calling it, Bill? I mean, uh, early, the parallel state. I haven't heard that. Uh, um, it, I, I like that. We talk about proxies, proxy government, uh, de facto feds sometimes. You know, my friend John DiUlio talks about the de facto feds. Uh, Donald Trump occasionally talks about the dark state. That's in there someplace, whatever it means to him. Um, and, you know, we basically know that the federal government has had a blended workforce since the beginning. Uh, the postal uh, postal Service was all contracted out in the first um, three, four decades of the federal government. Uh, we contracted out, obviously we had contractors uh, who were doing defense procurement uh, or uh, uh, fulfilling defense contracts. There were lots of scandals uh, during the Revolutionary War about profiteering. Uh, there was a lot of concern during the, the Valley Forge um, uh, uh, the winter, the brutal winter at Valley Forge, about the provisioning of the the, uh, the forces, the American forces, because contractors, merchants who had agreed to deliver supplies, uh, were profiteering by keeping them and selling them to a much more um, lucrative market on the coast. So we've seen these issues come up over and over, and we're going to have a blended workforce for the foreseeable future. There are things that we're doing in the federal government right now that ensure that we will be dependent on contractors into the future. We've got skill gaps. The federal government has a sluggish process. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. But this whole project was just designed to find a number and see if we could estimate on an apples to apples, head to head, uh, how big is the federal government's workforce. And I'm going to take you through that. We have a three, at least three workforces that we keep track of. One are civil servants. And we have deep data on civil servants. Um, and uh, I've seen good analyses done of this by many of our colleagues uh, here and in other universities. We can almost tell you the shoe size of every federal employee. We know where they went to school to a certain extent, yes? what their degree was, for sure. The data is available uh, to the uh, of Yes. So I should say the federal government knows a great deal. We know 
you know, where they went in government, how long they stayed, how they moved. We know when they were promoted. We know how they uh, moved upward. And there's been some good research. We were talking about uh, uh, David Lewis's uh, work on this. That's what I, you know, this notion we can, we can see what their grades were, uh, what their performance appraisals were. We can see motion in there, but you're, you're, it's very difficult to get. Uh, and uh, appropriately so to some extent because we want to protect the confidentiality of our employees. Um, we've got contractors uh, who deliver product uh, and products and services. We've got various categories of contractors. We've got, per, you know, the uh, individual side-by-sider, as I call them, the person who is working at a desk next to a Fed reporting to the same uh, supervisor. Um, we've got all sorts of things going on s inside of this workforce. Um, and we've got to be careful how we describe this workforce, and we've got to be careful about how we might count this workforce. Um, grantees, final group. Um, the grant workforce in the federal government, or that, that serves the federal government with products and services, these are not recipients. These are the people who receive grants to purchase activities, uh, let's say highway construction. Uh, big highway construction budget in the federal um, uh, you know, annual appropriations, the people who actually lay the asphalt, lay the contract, you know, or the concrete can be seen as um, sort of de facto feds to some degree. And Diulio in particular talks a lot about the fact that we have built a very large delivery system in the federal government for uh, benefits of one kind or another, public goods of one kind or another, and we've done it without hiring a lot of people. We do it through uh, uh, different uh, procurement methods of one kind or another. Let's see. So we don't know very much about the uh, contract and grantee workforce. We know a lot about feds, as I said, but we don't know much about the contractors and the grantees. Uh, in terms of the kinds of things that we look for in federal employees. We don't know much about the head-to-head -head costs. We don't know much about performance, and we know very little about whether the actual work um, is inherently governmental in a way. The term inherently governmental is very important to us because in theory, contractors and grantees should not be doing work that is so significant that it should only be done by feds. Now there's a little bit of a conundrum in that stating that you're not allowed, an uh, inherently governmental function is something so directly important to the federal government that it should only be done by a federal employee. And there's constant debate about what these terms mean. And we look a little bit at this in this book. Uh, the government industrial complex title comes from Eisenhower's speech about the military industrial complex. Whoops, Southwest changes are required. Too bad, uh, we won't do them right now. Um, this is his speech right here. We can play a little bit uh, from it. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. How to do this? Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. So that's the setup for this conversation that we're having today. 
this notion that we were, you know, Eisenhower was quite concerned and at the time, you know, was under a tremendous amount of pressure uh, from Democrats uh, getting set for the 1960 election um, and being besieged by arguments that we needed more stuff, more bombers, more missiles. There were allegations that the administration was putting the nation at risk by underinvesting in uh, closing the missile and bomber gap. And so we have this speech at the very end of uh, Eisenhower's term, right before he left office, warning us about the unwarranted influence of this combination of a vast military establishment with a uh, uh, federal establishment and the pressure uh, to pull and pour in money, um, even if it wasn't of value. So this is kind of the setup for this argument here about this notion of uh, unwarranted uh, influence. We found a few years ago, we, I mean, the, uh, the speechwriters who did this uh, piece for uh, Eisenhower, and he did edit it with some care, found a stack of draft reports in a cabin in Minnesota, a fishing cabin in Minnesota. And you might say, well, how the heck did that happen? Or I could use Minnesotan, how the heck did that happen? I just don't know. What could have happened there, Ollie? Uh, what had happened was that the speechwriter, Malcolm Moose, who eventually became the president of the University of Minnesota, had a fishing cabin up in the north, north country, the northern lake region, and in a corner of the fishing cabin uh, was a stack of papers that he had somehow offloaded, and a historian, or somebody found them, and then the historians, the Minnesota uh, Library Association, and so forth. These documents are now all in the National Archives, and we can see the language that was being used, and there was an effort for, this is a war hero, the Allied commander from World War II, with speechwriters proposing language like, we've got to worry about the merchants of death. Now, Eisenhower said, well, I think that's a little bit too strong, but we ended up with a pretty strong message about watching the military uh, and being careful about unwarranted influence. Now, we have this now government industrial complex, which is, does contain a defense component, a workforce of contractors, grantees, and feds, military personnel uh, in defense, but we also have a parallel and often integrated confluence of, of military, now, excuse me, of um, uh, civilian, uh, federal employees, and so forth on the domestic side. Um, and the question really that comes to fore is sort of, if we're gonna compare headcounts, and you, you heard how Eisenhower was struggling with how to measure this. He talks about 3.1 million people engaged in the defense establishment. We, we still don't know what that number actually, where that number actually came from, but he was talking about headcount, he was talking about uh, budget and so forth, and that leads us uh, here. These are the workforces compared. So according to my data, from 2017, and we're going to talk about where that data comes from, the non-defense government industrial intersection is larger in total than the defense component. It's just larger. It's spread out in many agencies. So you've got transportation, uh, veterans affairs, a very large agency uh, with a large number of contractors hospital system and so forth, HHS for sure, but you come down here to EPA, HUD, NASA, Justice, if you put them all together and you said, well, where is the largest opportunity for unwarranted influence, if that's the term you want to use, where is the largest need for care, perhaps, in, in terms of making sure that we're well integrated, it might be in many of these agencies over here and it might also be in defense. The point here of this a chart is just to show you the distribution. We talk about defense because it's a big item in the budget and it's often set aside as a single item in the budget. But when you collect this uh, set of data, these estimates, it turns out that the non-defense uh, part of the government industrial complex is very large indeed.
Well, we're captured, uh, we're captured by it. Whenever we start a new administration, we start talking about the size of government. Yes, money's important. But politically speaking, the number of people, the headcount is much more uh, salient to the public and to uh, the lobbying community and to the Congress than the dollars. I mean, we can go into some detail about whether a multi-trillion dollar budget and comparing uh, size of uh, expenditures um, is a good metric. This is just to amplify the notion that the military industrial complex involves both. And you cannot look back in time, uh, to, you don't have to look back in time too far to find uh, evidence that presidents come into office oftentimes promising to downsize the federal workforce. Uh, it has been an ongoing politics for uh, a, a long period of time. Uh, every president since Eisenhower entered office saying we're going to constrain the size of the federal government and headcount is one significant uh, indicator. What was Trump's first executive order, for example? You remember? Well, anybody? The first executive order in the Trump administration. A hiring freeze. Why? That's ridiculous. Because as you say, the real cost is in the expenditure. But why a hiring freeze? Why, why do that? I mean, it's, it's irrelevant. It, it, it really didn't work. There weren't very many people caught in it, right? Uh, very minimal effects, yeah? Um, why? Why do that? Why did, well, what? So that was like a fiscal problem. You're trying to say I want to curtail government expenditure, which is different than saying I want to curtail the influence of government in, in different... Well, so, but in this particular argument, headcount becomes a surrogate for, uh, and on a, from a lobbying standpoint, the people listening in Washington and elsewhere are saying, well, headcount is a surrogate for expenditure. It's easier for Americans to understand that government's too big. We, we can't really articulate government being too big in headcount if you're only counting feds, so we, we, we uh, focus on the feds. This is just a way of getting an equivalency in the argument about who delivers the goods for the federal government. Um, and then there are questions of accountability. So the contracting community understands that there are jobs here and they understand that the jobs come from the purchase of activity. So it's a little bit like, you're right, but we want a fuller picture. So Clinton comes into office and he says, we need to cut the federal workforce by 100,000 FTE. Uh, Reagan comes into office and promises a significant downsizing. You get that with um, Nixon. Johnson and Kennedy didn't talk so much about downsizing, but they talked about great care keeping the size of government down. In other words, jobs matter politically. And you'll see in just a second, this is the federal workforce over time. You get periods of time, I mean, after 1950, uh, you get some movement up and some movement down, but great stability over time. And one reason we have that stability over time is, became, is because it became a political issue right away after the New Deal. So an obscure um, representative from Mississippi, Jamie Witten, uh, not known for much, uh, had one shining achievement, which was to put into effect in 1950 a two million FTE cap on the number of federal employees at any given time. You can see that the cap was broken from time to time. Uh, in the 1960s, the cap was broken by the Vietnam War. Defense expanded. You also had the Great Society. We had a hiring surge. You can see that for the next 30 years, uh, we were above line. These are all the baby boomers. You get all the baby boomers being hired above the line as well as below for agencies like EPA, HUD. In fact, EPA and HUD are the two agencies that are most vulnerable to retirements right now. They have the highest percentage of employees who will be retirement eligible over the next five years. HUD, 45% of its employees are either now eligible for retirement or will be 
within the next five years. Number two, EPA. And these two agencies, of course, were created in the 1960s, HUD, uh, 1965, and EPA, 1970. And you can see the impact of the 40-year uh, government career, 50-year government career, uh, playing out here. But you can see that the cap really created an issue of headcount. And, you know, Sean Spicer, uh, talented uh, um, orator that he was, came in, and one of the first statements he made from the White House uh, podium was how uh, Barack Obama had drastically increased the size of government. It was an abomination. It's excessive. And that's the argument that Spicer made at the time. It's just the politics of headcount and the politics of federal personnel. It, it doesn't show up a lot until you cross this two million line. And right now, um, I don't have the latest, I mean, the, the latest headcount uh, suggests, and you, if you look at the 2020 budget, this year, federal headcount's gonna go up 70,000 FTE. Now, this is a president who promised not to do that. And it's all because of the census. We're hiring a lot of seasonal employees to do the census. It's a ridiculous analysis, but you see how this works. Um, so let's continue with this. Wow. The thing we got to do here uh, to get some good estimates is to convert dollars into headcount. And that is really hard. That is really hard. Um, you've got to collect all the expenditures on procurement, and you load them up in the federal uh, procurement database. Um, FPDS, Federal Procurement Data System, right? And every transaction that the federal government makes is loaded into that database. So you've got all these records, about 10% of, of which are just no good. They're missing data. Uh, we, we have a sense that there's been a mistake. About 10% of all federal spending right now is not well recorded in this database. It's a lot better than when it was first established in 1978. It's gotten better, but it's still not great. So everything that I do here is an estimate. And when the shutdown began, people started calling me. You know, they say, well, how many people are affected? Well, you had the 800,000 affected by the shutdown, but then how many contractors and then how many grantees, how does it affect my state? How does it affect my community? Even the Council of Economic Advisors was trying to figure out what the downstream costs of the shutdown would be by counting the household spending of federal employees. So they rolled out the estimate of how much the shutdown would affect the economy. And then the head of the Council of Economic Advisors figured out that they forgot to include contractors. This was a story of the day kind of thing where the White House had to retract the estimate of the economic effects of the uh, shutdown and then double it to include the contractors. This is a little kind of a, a weird little wrinkle in that whole uh, conversation, but there's a lot of concern about who was being affected by the uh, shutdown and a lot of interest um, in these estimates. A lot of people wanted to know exactly how many people were being affected in their communities, a lot of reporters. We can't give that data, and it's estimates, you know? You, you got to put the estimate on this all the time. Um, the, the, the most interesting story was about a cafe in Ogden, Utah. It, it, a little cafe that uh, I think is recovering now. I'm going to go out uh, to visit a colleague of mine at Provo. I'm going to go up to Ogden. It was called the Bickering Sisters Cafe. And I was like, what a wonderful example. Uh, th this is a, a cafe in, on Main Street in Ogden. Ogden has a huge IRS uh, tax processing center. So from an economic standpoint, uh, the shutdown made a big difference. IRS was shut down. That processing center was shut down. At any rate, we use this data to kind of get at that kind of an issue. So you can get the contract data by looking at FPDS and the awards data from looking at the Federal Assistance Awards data system. Also flawed in its own way. Each one of these uh, uh, grant and procurement, uh, these contracts and grants, uh, 
can be linked to a North American industrial classification code. Some dangers there, some problems there. You got to be forthright about claiming it. This is an estimate. It's almost certainly an undercount. So if you're going to err in your estimates, do it on the undercount side rather than on the overcount. You don't want to be saying in this political environment that your estimate is possibly 10% higher than what it actually is. You want to be as conservative as possible, and that's what we try to do. You check these codes, you drive the expenditures through an input-output model of the economy. You then have headcount uh, labor hours associated with every dollar spent estimates of labor hours, and then you can assemble them into employees. That's where all these data came from. Any questions about that? All of this data is available on usaspending.gov. You can download it. It's really difficult to do the multipliers. It's just difficult. Um, and uh, it's just difficult. How's that? I'm not going to cry. Uh, but it's, it's difficult. Uh, all good things are difficult, I suppose. So here's the Obama record. Here's what we know. Uh, and we're going to talk just a little bit about this, but you can see the numbers here. Um, you know, you might be better off rounding to protect yourself, but these are the, the numbers. Uh, in 2015, we had 2,042,000 um, estimated uh, or full-time equivalent federal employees. 3.7 million contract, 1.6, uh, so forth and so on. You have a total workforce of about 9.1 million. So let's round it down just to be careful, somewhere around 9 million. You can take the military and the Postal Service out. We end up with a workforce, you know, a little bit over around 6 million, somewhere in that neighborhood. Did I get that right? We got 2 plus 3, 5.7. Um, about 7.2, um, somewhere in that neighborhood. Here's what happened over time with these figures. You can follow the trend lines. So what is the most stable line here? It's federal employees. So in terms of understanding this workforce, we see that the feds stand put because of Jamie Witten at about 2 million. So what's happening here in 2010 that causes Sean Spicer to go ballistic. What's going on that explains this peak? What is it? We have a war, full-throated war in Iraq and Afghanistan, so we're spending a lot of money on equipment. We're spending a lot of money on operations of one kind or another. We have a rise in the number of grant employees also in 2010. What's happening there? Why is there a surge in grant employees? Well, because we had underemployed USC bench scientists. We had underemployed NYU uh, statisticians. Uh, we had the surge associated with the American Recovery Act and the tremendous injection of funding uh, into the grantee community. So we talked a lot during the period about things being shovel ready. What was shovel ready was being able to push money into grants that we already had established, whether it was highway construction, whether it was bench science, uh, whether it was analysis by think tanks of one kind or another. A lot of money went into per, uh, purchasing headcount. Now here, I don't want to cause anybody any uh, grief about this, but you can see that if you counted Obama's uh, record in 2010, 2012, and said, is he a big government fellow, right? You can look at the budget, for sure, as one indicator, and you can say federal spending went up dramatically. You can look at headcount. He looks like a big government president. If you take the measure in 2017, he looks like he had accomplished something in terms of reducing the true size of government as the wars ended. So we see some gains there that we pay attention to politically and the number of grants spent out. So this chart confirms to a certain extent
the fact that the Obama administration was actually trying to compress government or at least reduce government spending. And we can see it in the head count. So when Sean Spicer stands up in front of the press and says, Obama is a big government uh, Democrat, he drastically increased the size of government. When you look at these data, you say, you know, actually there was some compression as his administration came to a close. Any questions about this? This is the Obama record. You can see the number of federal employees came down from 10 to 17. And you'd say to yourself, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? I mean, really, you're talking about what? You know, 40,000 employees. But the you actually have the smoking gun. So what are the breakdowns of those contracts and grants? Are those all related? Uh, the, the contracts war related, mostly war related. The grants mostly stimulus related, the increases. Right, but you know, you say, well, it's only 40,000, you know? Um, but the reality is that 40,000 is a big number when you're looking for one way to tell Americans that you got a president who's wasting money by hiring bureaucrats. So it, it matters. Obama, uh, in 2017, you know, we had a, a 20,000 increase in the number of federal employees between 15 and 17. Does anybody have a clue where those employees were uh, deployed? Most of them? Veterans Administration, Department of Veterans Affairs. In response to legislation in 2014 that tried to deal with the veterans health care crisis. Shinseki, the secretary of uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, was forced to step down because of the waiting time uh, scandal in Phoenix and elsewhere. Veterans weren't getting appointments on time. So Obama's held to account and says, look at that big spending Democrat. He added this many federal employees. It's, you know, to a certain extent, we want to discipline this conversation so we get out of using headcount to describe what the federal government is. So I'm kind of on your side at the end of all of this. But we can't deal with this argument until we figure out where the heads actually exist. What drives movement back and forth between the government workforce, demographic pressures, bureaucratic pressures, and political pressures. Let, let me just show you the demographic. Um, as I told you about the Volcker report, the quiet crisis really does matter. And a lot of it is embedded in the demographics of how the federal personnel system uh, works. Uh, the personnel system in terms of hiring is very slow. Uh, on average, it's been 90 days, maybe 100 days from posting to uh, hiring. Um, we just can't seem to push it down. And we got some data in here from ongoing surveys of the private sector, but we're slow. Does that create a temptation to use contractors? Maybe it makes you think, you know, Maybe we can convert this job or at least, you know, use a contract to purchase labor. Why would delays in hiring matter? Because you've got to get the work done. So this is a bureaucratic pressure that forces the federal government a little bit into contracting in lieu of federal employees. And that's what we want to be thinking about. Why would you use a contractor or a grantee can be the logical thing to do for a particular program. Why would you use, use a contractor or a grantee in lieu of a Fed? In part because it's easier. It's more convenient and in part because contractors have skills that may not be available on quick order in the government. You got another question? Sure. Is there uh, some research on the productivity difference between a contractor and a federal employee? What's your answer to that? Not, not much. Not, not, there, there are inferences. For example, we have the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey every year, although it's going through some changes right now. Um, we can see who appears to have higher employee engagement. So in terms of a sense of the link between your work and your mission, your feeling of satisfaction, your general belief that you're treated fairly, we can see in side-by-side -side surveys that the federal government is trailing the private sector in terms of overall workforce satisfaction. And we have a term for that that some people use, uh, 
Uh, you know, we talk about that as an employee engagement factor. That's theoretically related to performance. Yeah? So we can look at that. So we can say, yeah, it probably makes a difference to productivity, but we're not entirely sure. It certainly matters to productivity if you've got jobs that need to be filled and you're in a de facto hiring freeze. Um, we've got the aging. You know, the baby boomers have been there a long time. And they move up the hierarchy as they age. There's a certain amount of automatic movement up the hierarchy. And so eventually you get a change in the shape of government where you're drawing on um, contractors, to a lesser extent grantees, to fill in holes in agencies that have skills that are missing. Uh, Rand wrote a report called Hackers Wanted. They, they want to have sort of their encouraging defense and other agencies to pursue high-tech skills because we have tremendous demand for high-tech skills that we cannot uh, fill in the federal government as it's currently constructed. Yes? Is this different from previous cohorts? Like, is it, is it different to say that because the baby boomers are aging that we need to fill in different roles with younger cohorts? I mean, wouldn't that have happened as the baby boomers were coming at age two? There is a little, yes, is the answer. There, is a, there was a cohort effect, it appears to be, in the 1970s. It's, it's really funky data. Uh, you know, it, it all is to some degree. But we can see that the federal pay schedule, uh, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s is moving up like this and then it drops suddenly. So the average pay uh, personnel expenditures in the federal government goes up like this. And yeah, sort of the late 60s, early 70s, it kind of rolls over. And then it starts going up. And we expect that it's going to come down because of cohort generational effects. That the, the 1950s and 60s, these are great, uh, these are New Deal hires. So people are staying longer, they're making more money, it's perfectly appropriate. Then they start to retire. We've got HUD and EPA and new agencies being formed. So the amount of money we're spending on salaries drops and then it starts going up. It is not a pure upward trajectory. So we see this, that, you know, in comes a generation, they're going to stay. Now, whether the millennials are going to be longtime stayers, we don't know. I did a survey of cohorts of the leading uh, schools of public affairs and administration. USC was one. Um, NYU was in there, Michigan, Harvard, Syracuse, um, you know, the, the top 20s. Uh, I did cohort surveys asking people for job histories in the class of 1972, 1973. Then we looked at 80, 81. We looked at 90, 91. And then we took a last look with this project. And what we were seeing is that in the, 19, um, 50, in the 1970 cohort, the number one destination was government. When you said, well, where did you start? It was in government. By 1980, you start to see more and more people from the major schools going nonprofit. More and more, because in part the Great Society funding, we created more and more nonprofit uh, activity under grants of one kind or another, these kinds of things. Lots are going on. And we also started to see more rotation that students were leaving and going to government or nonprofit, and they were staying five years before ma na making the next switch. Or, you know, I mean, these attitudes were changing. By the 1990s, we saw nonprofits being tied basically with government as a destination and more and more uh, students going private. I mean, we can see it in our cohorts of students. They're going wherever there's good work to be had. And you and I were talking about that uh, early, earlier um, about this and this notion that is there a preferred destination of our schools? Well, I, I think the preferred destination of our students is good, mission-driven work. Did I get that right? You know, that there, there is something about having, and if the work migrated, it's not on you. You know, I remember uh, being up at the Kennedy School teaching, and, you know, uh, I don't know, in the, the, the late 1990s, and there was a star student who took a job with McKinsey. I was having a conversation with one of 
um, our public administration uh, lead scholars in the field. And he was saying kind of like, where did we go wrong? Why did he go to McKinsey? How could we have failed? And I'm like, how, how was the job offer? What did the job offer look like? What's he doing? Maybe the student picked McKinsey because it was a really good job with an opportunity to make impact. We've got a multi-destinational public service. And we talk about this all the time at Wagner to, uh, you know, uh, puzzlement. We tend to teach to a single destination in some of our schools. Okay, so at NYU Wagner, the destination where a, a large number of our students go is city government. We've got a big city government with lots of big important missions. So sometimes the teaching can go that direction. But other times we see a large number of our students going uh, to state government, uh, other local governments, very few going federal. We don't know why. We don't, we don't think it's a bad thing. We just, you know, we can see it happening. And we see a lot going nonprofit and more and more going uh, uh, private. And the question then is how do we shape our curriculum so that our core courses and so forth can work for uh, our students wherever they'd like to go whether they want to also get engaged in social entrepreneurship or advocacy or whatever. Anyway, um, we've got these demographic factors. Just take a look at this. I mean, we've got this promotion speed, which creates vacuums at the bottom. And when we have to fill a vacuum at the bottom with a slow personnel process, difficulties getting funding, uh, so forth and so on, we may turn to a contractor in lieu. And when you talk to federal managers about why they would do this, some of them will say, look, I got a short-term assignment, fast to recruit, easy to dismiss. Some managers will tell you that they like contracting out because it gives them a little more flexibility in getting the job done. This is the list of all federal uh, uh, senior positions, uh, uh, presidential appointee positions in the hierarchy. It's, it's wild. Somebody once said to me, Can, what do you mean there's an associate assistant deputy attorney general? I said, well, there's not only an associate assistant deputy attorney general, there's an assistant associate. And this person said, well, that can't be true. It just can't be true in the same department. And I'm like, I don't know, Google it. And you can Google all these positions and you will find the person who occupies, uh, my favorites are like the chief of staff. Chief of staff is the fastest spreading title in the federal government. It used to be assistant secretary. It's crazy, you just watch this. So I, I you know, the monitor uh, leadership directories of the federal government, you know, they'll show you all these titles and it does become a little bit of a race to see. You're nobody if you don't have a chief of staff, right? And you're not much of a chief of staff if you don't have a deputy chief of staff. So, you know, you talk to, to politicals who are doing this, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, I keep looking at you because you have this um, interest in this. It's a crazy business, right? So um, anyway, you had a question? My, my question is, since you mentioned the Julio, I remember my impression, he published this small book a few years ago. I think his main argument was that we need a bigger federal bureaucracy. It's so I want to ask you, do you share that same view, view about the Julio argument? Or argument or? It was, he wrote a book to sort of bring back the bureaucrats. Yeah. So his argument is that this proxy workforce, which is what he calls it, um, the parallel workforce, uh, I used to call it the shadow workforce, the hidden workforce. It's more expensive, uh, less accountable, uh, not as good. Bring back the bureaucrats. My feeling about it uh, from a political standpoint is good luck on that one. Uh, it is so ingrained now that even small changes, I look at you about this, even small changes in the number of feds will provoke a backlash. Obama got in trouble on that small number of new employees, even though they were at the Veterans Department. The persistent public opinion regarding federal waste, um, wastefulness and so forth, there are lots of reasons for that data. There's a wonderful scholar at Brookings, Vanessa Williamson, who's doing wonderful work on what people mean when they say they think the federal government is wasteful. Is that a program attitude? Is that really because there are too many federal employees? But presidents, all of us, we kind of react to it. And um, 
It's, it's just an issue that we have to struggle with. Uh, so I do not believe that we're going to get back there. I think what we need is a multi-sector workforce approach, policies that understand that there is this uh, multi-sector workforce and integrate and understand how we deploy it more effectively and prevent the undue influence and make it accountable. Right now, we pay a lot of attention to what feds do. We don't pay a lot of attention to what uh, the contractors do beyond the dollars. There have been some good studies of the the head-to-head -head cost of federal employees versus private employees. I mentioned cemetery workers. The Veterans Administration has cemetery workers. They are federal employees. Other agencies also have cemetery workers as contractors. How do they compare on a dollar-to-dollar -dollar cost? The answer is federal employees are always less expensive than, almost always less expensive than contract employees for the same job classification. Why? It's the overhead. The federal government does not, does not pay overhead. We, we don't price in the cost of the treasury building where the IRS is. Private uh, contractors, and the federal government doesn't pay profit. So when we had this period of job competitions in the early 2000s, the federal employees almost always won the head-to-head -head job competitions with private firms for the same work because they were less expensive, they were more efficient in some ways, um, and we see on the cost basis that uh, feds are less expensive, even though the uh, standard criticism of feds is that they make too much money. Well, at their educational levels, at their history levels, time on the job, uh, experience and so forth, they're pretty inexpensive. But when you look at it and you say cemetery worker here, cemetery, these head-to-head -head comparisons are very difficult to get. They do show that the feds are not overpaid, but how do you deal with the overhead issue? That's a fair debate, you know. So if private workers were in the Treasury building, would they make uh, less? And we don't factor in profit. Anyway, other questions? I've left you uh, breathless. Yes. Are these contracts driven by, um, or are they uh, just for, or created by agencies, or is, are they congressionally uh, allowed and then agencies write the contracts? Like who, who's driving, who's on the government side of the contract? Go ahead. It's both. It's both, yeah. Some are legislatively you know, dictated uh, to the agency. I mean, you, we've got a lot of rules on contracting, but um, uh, about uh, four years ago, uh, Senator Van Hollen, who represents Maryland, which is a big uh, federal employee state, uh, asked the Congressional Budget Office to prepare head-to-head uh, -head counts of employees by contract, grant, and um, uh, Fed. That if we're going to cut the federal workforce 10 percent, we should cut the uh, contractor workforce by 10 percent, and he wanted headcount. He did not want dollars because it's an awkward transition. CBO was kind of like, it can't be done. Uh, these databases are very um, difficult to manipulate, and they are also fraught with uh, error. So CBO just basically said, we're CBO, we can't do it. You know, let light do it, kind of. And I'm, you know, I'm fine with it. I'm not CBO, and you should not treat these data as if they're CBO uh, uh, verified. Uh, the General, uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, recently wrote a report saying that these data are, quote, sufficiently reliable, end quote, for doing broad trend analysis. Now, that's not a big endorsement for using these data to make personnel decisions. They raise a question, you know, about where we distribute labor and what the federal career looks like, where you're going to go, what you're going to study, those kinds of things. They raise important questions about the politics of all of this. And they also give me the opportunity. I've got wonderful stuff in, in, in this on how Congress has lost the ability to legislate on government reform. I mean, Congress couldn't write a good bill on this issue if Congress's future depended on it. 
the staffs have been eviscerated. The investigations process has been deeply damaged, uh, and you can blame Boehner for it. You can ba blame Gingrich for it. You can blame a little bit on Pelosi, and so forth and so on. But the point is that this becomes a way of talking about a lot of issues uh, that bedevil federal performance right now. And that's why it's fun, uh, but it's also fraught with good questions about why you would do it. One last question. Well, you can have another, you know, we, we, you know it's, it's, it's good to activate a couple of people. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if it was in your uh, political reasons slide that we can see, but is, is one of the reasons that there's all this outsourcing is because it's a better political tool to divert money to private citizens rather than having the federal government do it? You've, the, 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 there's a section in that part of the uh, argument about dark money. And, you know, members of Congress rarely run, some do, if you're Chris Van Hollen, you represent or you're, you're, you're representing Northern Virginia, you might say, I brought this many jobs and I was involved in the shutdown. And the shutdown does present a real opportunity for people to talk about uh, the, the federal service because we were reintroduced to the feds during the shutdown. We found out what they do for a living, right? Uh, and Americans were like, this is bad. These people are doing important work, like certifying the 737, which of course has been contracted on through to Boeing, and there are lots of reasons why that happened. So you don't see too many uh, Congress uh, people in South Dakota. We got uh, one seat going back and saying, uh, I'm responsible for 200 feds. You love to go back there and say, I'm responsible for 2,000 private employees who were funded under this. So contractors, as a political issue, um, tend to appeal to uh, uh, businesses and so forth. That's where you get the unwarranted influence. The dark money that flows in uh, from Boeing and other, you know, where you just can't see it and it's starting to become more visible, but there's a lot of politics around this. Uh, federal employees are not an easy sell unless you're in uh, one of the 10 regional um, uh, headquarters uh, or you're in a, a very heavy Fed occupied states and the nonprofit uh, many nonprofits. The, the one that comes to mind, if you're looking for an example, Southwest Key. You know Southwest Key? Southwest Key is the nonprofit that has been housing uh, children in detention facilities along the border. And they're in trouble right now. The Inspector General of HHS is going uh, on that. It's a nonprofit. Now, some people say, can't be. Nonprofits can't do this kind of thing. But there's a lot of issues around their charter schools and so forth. And that's part of this dialogue about when you want a contractor, when you want a grantee, who are you going to go to, how do they match up against feds, and are feds all properly deployed? So we're going to have a lot of trouble, this is the end, uh, getting any of you to go into the federal government if you believe it's going to take you 40 years to get to the top. It's just not a sellable position. And how many of you are willing to wait 100 days once you apply for a job for an answer. I don't know. Um, my students are a little iffy about that one. And then you got the nonprofits and the contractors you know, competing with each other. It's a really interesting way of getting traction, uh, this data on issues that are of profound concern and that need a lot deeper uh, research and discussion as we enter this big generational shift. If I'm right about these trends that you asked about, we are on the edge right now of hiring a 40-year workforce if they behave like the past uh, generations. Are they going to stay that long? Well, you say no, and there's some data saying you're right, and then there's some data that says, I don't know. So we're right on that edge right now. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting period. Anyway, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. I like this use of the name Salam. Okay.